So welcome to the top videos session, the anterior segment part. Uh, can I call upon my other co-judges, Dr. Narayan Bodolai, Dr. Jatinder Singh Balla, Dr. Medha Nitin Prabhu Desai, Dr. Ashok Gar. I think we'll wait for another two minutes for other judges to arrive uh, because this uh, we can just run through the uh, presentation so that the people who are present can just probably raise their hand and show that they are present in the hall. No, it's a competitive session. We need the judges. Uh, the order goes like the Dr. Prabhu Bhaskaran. You are here? Okay. Dr. Rajendra Prasad. Dr. Susan Jacob. Dr. Mrinmoy Das. Okay. Dr. Samar Kumar Basak. Okay. Till come. Okay. Dr. Swati Vallabh. Dr. Jeevan Titiyal. I think who will be presenting? Okay. Dr. Leonel Raj. Okay. Dr. Grover. Dr. Amrita Sani. Dr. Shalu Baveja. Okay, sir. Dr. Kishan Prajapati. Dr. Roshan T. Okay. Dr. Krishna Pujita. Yeah. Dr. Aishwarya. Yeah. Dr. Ramaya Rajas. Okay. Dr. Rashmi Krishna Murthy. Okay. Dr. Avanindra Gupta. Dr. Ekta Rushi. Dr. Soumya R. Okay. Dr. Lisa. Read out the instructions. The duration for each video will be 8 minutes and uh, you have to conclude before that. 
and anything that uh, over the last eight minutes will be held against you and that can probably some marks may be cut for that so before you start you have to probably introduce yourself because uh, we need to actually give the marks sometimes there will be some confusion with the title so better you introduce yourself uh, before you start and every member it actually aos mandates that every member who representing a video in a competitive session has to be a ratified aos member so they have actually asked us to ask your aos membership number also but that, that may not be really necessary but if you are not a ratified member please do inform us before because that cannot be taken for uh, uh, scoring for putting the marks so all uh, membership numbers up to 19899 Are ratified. So, if somebody has a membership, a recent membership which is more than one nine eight nine nine, they can't present in this session. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Meeda Prabhu Desai and Dr. Narayan Bordolai and me, Dr. Krishna Prasad. We will be judging this session. Uh, we are ready with your mark sheets. Uh, you are ready with the timers. Eight eight minutes is the time. Okay. Once they start presenting, you can switch on the time. Okay. Uh, anybody who is busy with some other session can probably come and present in the end. We'll go with the order that has been given to us. So, can we? I mean, I hope everybody's videos are already loaded. No laptops are allowed here. Uh, so, please uh, uh, do not present from your own laptops to avoid the wastage of time. Uh, can we start the first uh, video presentation by Dr. Prabhu Bhaskaran on extraocular needle guided haptic insertion technique of SFL XNIT? In this film, we aim to demonstrate Terminator chopper used in terminal chop technique for. So in order to, uh, I mean, uh, given the marks. Extraocular needle guided haptic insertion technique for scleral fixation, the producers have no financial disclosures. With a population of 1.3 billion, India is the second most populous country in the world. A large population brings in unemployment and poverty. Poverty in turn. decreases health care and eye care access to a major portion of rural and semi urban india given this scenario dr g venkata swami 
started Arvind Eye Care System in 1976 with mission to eliminate needless blindness. Community outreach to tackle cataract related treatable blindness was the backbone of Arvind's existence. Eye camps conducted from the most remote rural areas to semi-urban areas in southern India became the means for Arvind to reduce cataract blindness. Manual small incision cataract surgery is the dream surgery to address the restraints of cost, time, volume and low ophthalmic surgeon to patient ratio in the country. Being a major institute addressing volume as well as training cataract surgery, though the portion of a fake year generated is comparable to global standards, the absolute numbers on an annual basis are relatively high. It is our responsibility to tackle this volume of a fake year generated by the large number of cataract surgeries. Though we could be the Spider-Man of eye care saving the world from cataract blindness, with great power comes great responsibility. Enter SFIOL technology. Many innovations have been made in the field of SFIOL technology regarding what can be done with the haptics once they are brought out through the sclera right from the original Gabus intra-scleral tank to Agarwal's glued IOL as multitude of problems can be encountered while exteriorizing the haptics, they can be failure of handshake technique due to instrument angulation intraocularly. Can there be a technique that simplifies this hurdle in SFIOL surgery? Enter our extraocular needle guided haptic insertion technique or XNET. Here we make the routine gabbers intrascleral pockets at two diagonally opposite meridians. A fresh sclerocorneal wound made at a superior or temporal location as per the surgeon's choice is created. A 26 gauge needle is bent close to the hub. A small 2.5 into 3 mm bit of silicon cut out from a number 240 silicon band is used as a stopper. The bent needle is first pierced through this silicon stopper and the stopper is receded back till the bend in the needle. This loaded needle is passed through the sclera 1.5 mm behind the limbus and about a millimeter ahead of the commencement of the gabbers tunnel. The needle after being visualized well within the pupillary area is angulated towards the open sclera corneal incision and brought out through it using a McPherson forceps. Next, the leading haptic of the three-piece IOL is threaded into the lumen of the needle and is now exteriorized with ease. The silicon stopper is guided to the exteriorized haptic and the needle is then disengaged from the haptic. Note that the trailing haptic is still safely extraocular. Another 26 gauge needle similarly bent is now pierced through the sclera ahead of the gabus tunnel on the right side and brought out through the sclera corneal section. The trailing haptic is next threaded into the needle lumen and pulled out through the same entry wound. Once the lacking haptic is pulled through and exteriorized, both haptics are fixed into the intrascleral gabus tunnel. This video shows a patient with long-standing aphakia. The sclerotomies will be placed at 3 and 9 o'clock positions. A fresh superior sclerocorneal wound is fashioned due to the superior location of the main wound. The bent 26 gauge needle loaded with the silicon stopper is pierced through to create the first sclerotomy at 3 o'clock. Note the direction in which the needle passes till it reaches the safe pupillary zone. The needle is angulated towards the main wound. Note how the blunt tipped McPherson forceps depressing the posterior wound lip safely guides the needle with a sharp tip from within out. It is important to thread the haptic into the needle lumen deeply to at least 4 mm from the haptic tip so that it resists slippage. In one smooth move, the silicon stopper can be transferred onto the haptic before withdrawing the needle. Note that while targeting the trailing haptic, the silicon stopper is withdrawn a little to fixate 
yet give some extra mobility to the IOL. An important practical point that helps is to keep the needle at the far right end of the sclerocorneal wound while attempting to thread the trailing haptic. This minimizes the strain on the trailing haptic, preventing haptic deformities. It is always a good idea to hold the trailing haptic stably with the McPherson's forceps before retracting the needle. This prevents undue pull on the IOL optic or the leading haptic. Tucking the haptics interest clearly after removing the silicon stopper completes the procedure. Exnit can be used for exteriorization with any technique of sutureless intrascleral fixation of the IOL. It prevents intraoperative mishaps during intraocular haptic handing over. Most importantly, Exnit can be done in complex cases such as small pupil, post-traumatic aphakias with corneal scars or aphakias combined with ketoplasties such as DSEC or DMEC where poor corneal clarity is a major deterrent for intraocular manipulation. This has a very short learning curve. This clipping shows how exnit can be safely performed in an eye with severe compromise of intraocular view due to significant bullous keratopathy. Any intraocular haptic handing over technique would be a great risk in such a patient, but exnit eliminates the risk by changing the haptic transfer site to a completely extraocular location. A study of exnit technique was done in 50 eyes of 47 patients. Best corrected visual acuity of 0.5 log bar was 70% at one month post-operative scenario. The only post-operative complications encountered were transient corneal edema in 5 patients, dispersed vitreous hemorrhage in 5 patients, and post-operative hypotony in one patient, all of which resolved by the end of the first post-operative week. Exnit totally eliminates the manipulation of haptics inside the eye for all practical purposes. And we consider it as the safest technique described to exteriorize haptics. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Prabhu Bhaskarat. I welcome Dr. Ashok Garg, who is one of our judges. Uh, we have next the terminator chopper use in a terminal chop technique for nuclear segmentation mature heart cataract by Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, Dr. Raj, Rajendra Prasad. In this film, we aim to demonstrate terminator chopper use in terminal chop technique for full thickness nuclear segmentation in mature heart cataract. The authors have no financial interest in the subject matter of this film. Mature heart cataracts are virtually all nucleus. The nucleus is packed with cemented lamellies of hardened and compressed cortical nuclear fiber layers, making them physically identical to the solid hard rocks, stronger in compression but weaker in tensile strength. The greatest challenge is in breaking them down because it is a real difficult to segment these hardened and compressed cortical nuclear fiber layers with the routine FACO forces and chopping techniques. There are several techniques which we all have been practicing for the last 20 years but when it comes to these mature heart cataracts nothing works and quite often we do not achieve full thickness nuclear segmentation. The reason for that is with the current surgical technique the mechanics of segmentation is undertaken deep at the bulky heart center nucleus with the stressful high intensity compressive forces. But according to the mechanical rock excavation systems and Griffith theory of brittle fracture. It's always difficult to crush, incise, skull and segment these hard drops with compressive forces but relatively easier to crack and break with inside out dispersive mechanical forces. Cracking and breaking is still easier if the mechanical forces are applied at the open edge or naturally weak point in the form of micro cracks, notches, grooves or depression on the surface of these hard materials. To be effective, specially designed tools, wedges and feathers or pick is placed into a drilled hole, groove or natural crack. Then with a very simple maneuvering of driving the wedges between the feathers or tapping the pointed tip of pick heads into the crack forces them against the sides of the hole causes the rock to crack and split in tension. Crack automatically traverses through the entire rock 
simply breaking such a huge solid hard rock into two complete segments. Terminal chop, a newly introduced surgical technique, utilizes principle of secondary rock breakage system with stress concentration to break these unbreakable hard nuclei. In this technique, similar to cracking and breaking these solid hard rocks, a unique inside-out dispersive mechanical force is created to initiate a full thickness nuclear crack at the weakest soft and thin equator which simply traverses through the entire nucleus breaking it into two complete pieces. Mechanics of terminal chop initiates a tensile fracture in a more direct manner from the equator parallel to the nuclear surface, highly efficient with least crushing, least manipulation and minimal use of echo forces. Unlike in vertical chopping and horizontal chopping, utilizing crushing compressive forces with high stress to segment these hard nuclei. In the unique mechanics of terminal chop, chopper plays an important role as critical instrument maneuvers to crack the nucleus is performed by the chopper along with the FECO probe. The chopper used in terminal chop, a well acclaimed recently introduced new surgical technique by Rajendra Prasad is named as Terminator. Terminator is a specially designed blunt olive tip chopper to safely hook, hold, stabilize and then initiate a crack at the equator of the nucleus. The mode of action of Terminator is similar to drag tool, generating stress at the sides of the initial groove in the direction of the equator on the other side, parallel to the nuclear surface to create tensile fracture. Terminator consists of a round knurled handle which is similar for all types and a 60 degree angled distal shaft with a tip. Overall length of Terminator is 114 mm and length of the shaft is 12 mm. The tip is approximately 1.5 mm in length and angle at 80 degrees in relation to the remaining distal portion. The inner surface of the tip is flat, blunt wedge edge angled 60 degrees to the axis to create a nick and crack at the periphery of the nucleus adjacent to the FECO probe and to prevent sideways slippage of the tip. Vertically, there are two grooves next to the wedge inner surface intended to engage and achieve firm grip of the nucleus for cracking and lateral separation while preventing vertical shift of the nucleus. To achieve perfect dynamics of terminator, the chopper used in terminal chop technique, the following steps are taken. First, we need to create a large central capsular axis with an intended 5.5 to 6 mm in diameter. Then a short, shallow, narrow central trench is created, sufficient to fit the FECO tip to achieve a proper plane of depth in the nucleus. Then using the hyperpulse or burst mode with high vacuum settings, the FECO tip is engaged at the distal end of the trench and impaled into the superficial plane of the nucleus keeping the tip directed towards the equator parallel to the pupillary plane to achieve firm grip at the periphery within the equator of the nucleus. While nucleus is firmly held in position with the FECO tip, equator of the nucleus is then slightly drawn within the capsulotomy edge. Terminator is then very simply passed around the lens equator to hook and engage the full thickness nucleus. Chopper is then simply drawn through the open edge just within the equator of the nucleus initiating a full thickness crack adjacent to the FECO tip. Chopper then takes a lateral position within the initial crack adjacent to the FECO tip without making any horizontal excursion. Initiate 90 degrees laterally directed back to force breaking the entire nucleus into two complete segments. Same procedure is repeated on the hemi-nuclei making multiple fragments depending upon the hardness of the nucleus. Each pre-lens fragment is then drawn by the FECO probe and emulsified. Terminal chop has several advantages over the techniques currently used to ensure less endothelial cell loss and less post-operative inflammation leading to a faster recovery and maximal visual rehabilitation. Mechanics of nuclear segmentation is very simple, swift, safe and 100% effective with least manipulation least FECO forces and minimal energy consumption. To conclude, principle of mechanical rock excavation with the drag pick system could be safely used to break these solid mature hard cataracts. 
Terminator, the chopper used in terminal chop technique holds all the properties of drag pit to generate optimum tensile force to initiate crack at the open edge equator of the nucleus. Terminator is highly efficient, least traumatic, giving minimal stress on the zonules and posterior capsule while giving firm hold of the nucleus along with the FACO probe to complete the mechanics of the nuclear segmentation. Complete nuclear segmentation achieved with terminal chop propagate a quick and safe nuclear fragment emulsification with least manipulation and minimal use of FACO energy resulting in exceedingly satisfactory post-op radical results. Thank you for being with Terminator, the chopper used in terminal chop technique in this video presentation. Thank you. Uh, next video is uh, Smile or Weight Dermoid. Chief presenting author is Dr. Susan Jacob. Susan Jacob. She's not there, okay. Uh, the next video film is Salvage and Preserve the Utmost from Rakage. Chief presenting author is Dr. Mrinmay Das. Doctor, I can't. Dr. Choudhury to be ready for the next video. Damage to the iris as a result of trauma to the globe is not uncommon. In this video, I will try to show the management of two cases which sustained extensive trauma to the iris. This is my first case. A three-year-old child presented to us with the difficulty of vision and photophobia for the past six months following trauma to the globe. The trauma had resulted in globe rupture and iris prolapse and globe repair had been done immediately following the trauma six months back at a local hospital. On slit lamp examination at our institute, we found that the child had traumatic cataract with near total aniridia as a result of the trauma and the subsequent surgical intervention. A capsulorexis of adequate size was made and phaco aspiration completed in the usual manner. Since the case had almost near total aniridia, I decided to implant two aniridia rings to compensate for the iris defect. One aniridia ring was inserted through the main port and dialed into place inside the capsular bag. The second ring was then implanted in a similar manner. After this came the tricky part, the proper alignment of the two rings so that the iris defect could be covered completely. Rearrangement of both the rings was done with two dialers in such a way so that the black plates of one ring would cover the gaps of the other ring. The iron was implanted in the bag below the rings. With the help of a vitrector, posterior capsulorexis and vitrectomy was done. To check for residual vitreous in the anterior chamber, triamcinolone was used. Wounds were sutured and anterior chamber wash was done. My second case was a 20-year-old boy. 
He presented with traumatic cataract and traumatic mydriasis following blunt trauma to the globe with a cricket ball. Capsulorexis, phacoemulsification and IOL implantation was done. Pilocarpine was injected intracamerally but no constriction of the pupil was observed. With the help of Capsulorexis forceps, some traction was applied over the iris to find out the exact pupillary margin. I decided to use a 10-0 proline suture attached to two long straight needles and fashion a purse string suture. This would hopefully help me create a new pupil. Suturing was started from the 12 o'clock position and first the inferior pupillary margin was sutured. With the help of visco cannula, the needle was docked and taken out through the 5 o'clock port. The procedure was repeated for the superior half of the iris. Another port was created at around the 7 o'clock position. The inferior needle attached to the suture was cut with scissors and the remaining suture was taken out through the 7 o'clock port. The suturing was repeated for the iris in the 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock region and the needle was taken out through the 7 o'clock port. Finally, both ends of the suture were tied and adjusted for an adequate pupillary size. With the vitrector, an iridectomy opening was made. Some part of the crowded iris tissue at the pupillary margin was excised to enlarge the size of the pupil. The take home message, aniridia rings can be used easily inside the capsular bag in traumatic aniridia to cover the iris defect. With the help of 10-0 proline sutures, Pupillary circlage can be a good treatment option for traumatic mydriasis cases. Thank you. Thank you.
डॉक्टर तुहिन चौधरी वीडियो इज ऑल इज नॉट लॉस्ट डॉक्टर समीर बस We have no financial disclosures in this video presentation. In this short video film, we will be demonstrating how to do SLET, that is, simple limbal epithelial transplantation with double amniotic membrane transplantation, or AMT. We feel that double AMT helps in better expansion and protection of the limbal stem cells. Over the ocular surface. And this is the schematic representation of SLET with double layer of AMT technique. This four-year-old girl had an accidental line burn in her right eye while playing with a tuna packet six months ago. She had a painful eye with a totally conjunctivalized ocular surface and a moderate degree of symblepharon in her right lower lid. Her vision in that eye was positive perception of light with accurate projection of rays in all the quadrants. Digital tension along with B scan were normal in that eye. Considering her uncertain visual prognosis, no other doctors had been willing to do any surgical intervention in that eye. As her other eye was perfectly healthy, autologous slit with double layer of AMT was the best option. First, the symblepharon was released by sharp dissection of the conjunctiva from the corneal surface using Westcott spring scissors. 360 degrees conjunctival peritomy of the diseased eye was carefully done. A detailed resection was methodically done. All the fibrovascular tissue and pannus from the corneal surface were meticulously dissected bluntly using an iris spatula and then removed with corneal scissors. Amniotic membrane grafting was done. <coughs> the graft was placed over the bare ocular surface and fixated with fibrin glue. The cut edge of the amniotic membrane was tucked under the conjunctival peritomy. A 5 mm limbo biopsy was taken from the contralateral healthy eye.
harvested limbo tissue was delicately cut into eight to ten tiny pieces. which were then painstakingly transplanted using an amniotic membrane scaffold with fibrin glue. Another piece of my amniotic membrane was carefully placed over the limbal tissues and safely secured by a 10-0 nylon circumferential suture. A bandage contact lens with symbleforin ring were placed. Finally, a suture tarsography was done and the eye bandaged. Postoperatively, topical steroids and tapering dosage, antibiotics and lubricants were given in both eyes. The sutures were removed on the 14th day, by which time the ocular surface was totally epithelialized. The donor area also totally healed up with minimal scarring. This was the appearance at the two weeks postoperative visit. At the six weeks postoperative visit, the vision improved from perception of light and accurate projection of rays to 20 by 400. Her vision was not improving significantly due to central corneal stroma scars seen on anterior segment OCT here. We felt that deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty was necessary to further improve the vision in her right eye, but her parents were unwilling for any further surgery. At both the three months and the first year post-operative visits, her vision further improved to 20 over 200, with a stable ocular surface, with good cosmesis, and without any recurrence of neovascularization and or simbleferin. These are some of our patients who underwent the same procedure with better outcomes. So we feel that all is not lost, even when it may seem so, and hope reigns. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Uh, uh, we have next Dr. Swati Vallabh. Uh, you can please come on. And the next will be Dr. Jeevan Istitya. Uh, anybody else? No, no. For Dr. Titiyar, who is presenting? For Dr. Titiyar. Oh, I see. Yeah, Dr. Swati, please. Uh, she'll be presenting a video, Is Reverse Right? Tube insertion into the anterior chamber can be one of the most challenging steps in a pediatric implant surgery. Tube should be of adequate length to prevent tube retraction with growing child's eyeball and place sufficiently away from the endothelium to prevent endothelial damage. Tube insertion posterior to the limbus helps posterior entry into the anterior chamber. Long track and posterior tube entry helps prevent tube erosions. However, tube placement in the correct position is a challenge. The tube is always cut bevel up with a sharp bevel to facilitate easy entry. The most common difficulty faced during tube insertion is the misdirection of the tube into the sulcus or posterior chamber 
even when the heart needle entry is made in the anterior chamber. The bevel up position allows the sharper tip of the tube, which is posterior, to pierce the eye and pave the way for the rest of the tube. Since the sharper tip is posterior in the bevel up position, inadvertent posterior placement in the sulcus is common. A simple solution to this problem is to reverse the tube and insert bevel down. As the sharper tip is now anterior, the entry is into the AC rather than the sulcus. Once inside the eye, the tube can be rotated into the bevel up position again. Thank you Dr. Swati for saving some time for us. Uh, do we have now Dr. Ashok Grover presenting on behalf of Dr. Jeevan Tityal? No, your own. Yeah. That oh. is before Tityal is in, in the list, at least in the list that I have on uh, the phone. Okay, here it is after sir, no problem. Now we have Dr. Ashok Grover uh, who will be uh, giving, I mean, showing the video on creating an effective window, medial approach to optic nerve sheath fenestration. Uh, then can we have the next speaker, Dr. Lionel Raj, to be ready? After Dr. Grover, Dr. Lionel Raj, next. So this video presents a technique that simplifies the technique of optic nerve sheath fenestration, making it more effective. This video presents the surgical technique for optic nerve sheath fenestration by the medial approach. The optic nerve sheath fenestration is most commonly carried out for progressive visual field loss due to idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The patients present with chronic papilledema and large blind spots which go on enlarging and go on to constriction of the field and loss of vision. It may be needed for other less common causes like venous sinus thrombosis. This particular patient presented to us with a gradual decrease in vision. He was a 19 years old male and the vision was decreased to PL plus minus in the left eye. The disc showed papilledema and venous sinus thrombosis of a chronic nature was observed on MRV of the brain. The surgical technique is presented here. A large peritomy is carried out on the medial side. The superior and inferior rectus have a traction suture passed under them. The peritomy is enlarged. The exposure is widened on the medial side by giving two radial incisions above and below to get a good exposure to the optic nerve. The incisions are made as shown here. The exposure of the medial rectus muscle is improved by dissection of the tenons around the muscle. A hook can then be easily be passed under the medial rectus muscle. Once the muscle has been exposed well, 60 polygalactin sutures are passed superiorly and inferiorly in the fashion they are done for the squint surgery. Once these sutures are in position, the muscle can then be cut from the sclera. So a tenotomy scissor 
separates the muscle from the sclera leaving behind a small stump. A good traction suture through this muscle stump is critical. A continuous suture with a 4-0 silk is being passed and this will provide the critical pull both in a forward direction and outwards to give an exposure to the region of the nerve. The long posterior ciliary artery serves as a landmark for the position of the optic nerve. This is some fat covering the optic nerve that is seen here with some short posterior ciliary vessels being running over it. The retraction is done by a malleable retractor on the medial side and two cotton tipped applicators held by the assistants on the either side. The fat on the surface is dissected free till a good exposure of the nerve is seen. A fenestration is now being made in a longitudinal fashion through the nerve meninges with an MVR blade. You can see a very good flow of the CSF coming out of the nerve when this incision is made. Multiple fenestrations like this may be made. This is the other fenestration being made longitudinally away from the nerve and there is less egress of fluid now. It is important at times to create a window as shown in this picture here. Also, it is important to lyse any adhesions in the subarachnoid space. Here we are using a scissors to, to remove a window and now we are passing an instrument in the subarachnoid space to lyse the adhesions. This is critical to maintaining a good um, decrease in the pressure around the optic nerve. Once an effective window has been created, the closure can now be carried out. The traction suture is removed and the muscle is put back in position at the sterile stump of the medial rectus. So once the muscle is positioned back, a closure can then be carried out for the conjunctiva. It is important to get a good exposure, but it is also important that traction is applied in a gentle fashion and is not maintained for too long. The pupil is observed very closely during the surgical procedure. If any dilatation of the pupil is noted, the traction is relieved. Dilatation particularly on the medial side is frequently seen on persistent traction and every minute of traction is followed by relief of traction for a period of 1 to 2 minutes. Post-operative observation of the pupil and the vision is also important and is carried out every hour for the first 3 to 4 hours to ensure that there is no rise in the intraorbital pressure. A good closure helps in getting good results. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Grover. Uh, now we have Dr. Lionel Raj. The next will be Dr. Kishan Prajapati. Good afternoon everyone. I do not have any financial interest in the video. Multiple failed corneal grafts, repeat corneal transplants have the higher risk of survival as to primary transplants. 
and often times are the primary indications for Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis. The device has undergone several modifications to attain the present day standards. Multiple failed corneal transplantation are often associated with poor ocular surface which predisposes to several factors which challenge graft and capro device survival. Some of them which challenge grafts are the graft mills and infectious keratitis. On the other hand, various studies have shown the effectiveness of collagen cross-linking of cornea with riboflavin and UV radiation not alone in prevention of progression of keratectasia but also in prevention of corneal melts, the keratolysis and resisting infectious keratitis. In our study, we decided to cross-link donor cornea before Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis to overcome long-term post-operative melts and infections. <laughs> Corneal stiffening by conventional cross-linking procedure of riboflavin and UV rays on the cornea halt keratolysis and melts not alone in ectatic conditions like keratoconus but also in donor corneal tissues which are used as vehicles in Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis. The resistance may be contributed to the anterior corneal strength achieved by preoperative donor corneal cross-linking procedure with UV rays and riboflavin. Cross-linking of cornea with UVA 370 nanometer and riboflavin at 3 milliwatts per centimeter square for a duration of 30 minutes is known to resist proteolytic enzymatic digestion of the cornea. Cross-linked corneas fight against proteolytic enzymatic degradation of the keratocyte resulting in melts as an endogenous inflammatory process or an exogenous toxin associated infective process. Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis surgery is aimed at restoration of vision in cases of extreme corneal disorders of multiple graft failures and with ocular surface pathologies. Post-operative potential threats of raised intraocular pressure, graft melts and extrusion of device, infections and endophthalmitis are very challenging in addition to simpler retroprosthetic membrane formation especially in cases with ocular surface dysfunctions. While improved designs, refined surgical techniques and post-operative medications of topical steroids with or without immunosuppressives, anti-glaucoma medications and long-term topical antibiotics help in overcoming post-operative complications, there is always a higher risk of graft mills, keratolysis and infections post-capro. A very happy post-operative day one patient with useful vision of 2200 and a healthy graft device complex. The same after one month. After three months, six months, nine months and after 18 months with healthy device and a stable graft host junction and a device graft junction the incidence of corneal melts 
from literature ranged between 2.4% to 30% at an average follow-up of 21.3 months as reported by Lee. The incidence of infectious keratitis with a mean and standard deviation of 12.74 plus or minus 4.4% with a mean follow-up of 20 months stated by Lee. Robert and his colleagues reviewed and found 5.4% of the cases of Kpro over a period of 10 years progressed to infectious endophthalmitis and not merely infectious keratitis. Infectious endophthalmitis rates in Kpro were 12% in total, especially with OST increased to 26.3%. However, in all or three cases of OST with cross-linked Kpro and in fact one with glaucoma filtration device, none had an infection at 18 months. While the adverse effects of donor corneal cross-linking could hypothetically be negligent, the less understood beneficial effects against graft device infections and MELS may be considered significantly important. Hence, it's recommended a pre-Boston type 1 K-Pro donor corneal cross-linking to be a mandatory surgical protocol. However, a large case series with longer follow-up may be important to prove the hypothesis. Cross-linking of donor corneal button before Boston type 1 prostokeratoplasty with riboflavin and UV rays is effective in improving long-term post-operative graft strength, resisting infections and reducing keratolysis and melts, especially in cases with ocular surface disorders. This novel technique could be a promise in future and could be an integral part in all Boston type 1 keratoprosthetic surgeries. Robert is over. Next one is. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Lionel. <coughs> sir, I have a question, uh, one question. Uh, we think uh, we don't have that facility here right, right now. Sir. The competition okay. is like this. Thank you. Uh, next presenter is Dr. Kishan A. Prajapati. She will be showing C3R without use of UVA radiation. And the next people coming up are Dr. Roshan, then Dr. Krishna Pujita, and then Dr. Aishwarya. Huh? Do we have Dr. Krishan Prajapati? No? Okay, then uh, we move to Dr. Roshan T. Uh, dark side of the moon. A closer look at refractive practice. Do we have Dr. Roshan here? Okay. laser and femto laser rule the roost. Over 28 million procedures have been performed so far worldwide. With greater understanding and advances made every year, corneal refractive surgery has become safer than ever and excellent patient satisfaction post-operatively is guaranteed. But this can turn the other way around just like picking a tarot card. Let's look at the dark side of refractive surgery using these tarot cards. Dryness in the eyes is the most common side effect of refractive surgery and can be the main reason for patient dissatisfaction post-surgery. Up to 95% patients develop dry eyes post refractive surgery, but this is usually temporary. It is a multifactorial condition and its causes include damage to the goblet cells during talking, stromal nerve and subvasal nerve damage, inflammatory damage in the cornea, which 
changing ocular surface and tear film distribution. And infrequent blinking in post-operative period due to reduced corneal sensation. But is refractive surgery the only culprit? Large number of patients choose refractive surgery because of intolerance to contact lens due to dry eyes. Hence, comprehensive dry eye evaluation pre-operatively is necessary. Ocular surface disease index scoring is a good method to quantify dry eye symptoms and can make the patient aware of it pre-operatively. Raised OSTI is a good indicator of inflammation. All patients who have raised OSTI need complete dry eye evaluation. Raised OSTI pain score with normal shermers and tear film breakup time is an indicator of pain without stain, which is usually associated with inflammation near the nerve endings. This has to be treated by anti-inflammatory medications. Vitamin D and B12 deficiency also play a role. This patient underwent photorefractive keratectomy for low myopia and has not gained good quality of vision. She had no risk factors for the development of haze, but still ended up with haze. Why do low myops develop unexpected haze post photorefractive keratectomy? We decided to have a closer look at the cell biology for answers. Epithelium was collected in all patients who underwent PRK. Gene expression in epithelium of patients who developed haze was compared with age and power match controls. It was found that eyes with haze had reduced expression of structural proteins and increased expression of pro-inflammatory genes. Hence, development of haze is a multifactorial process which leads to abnormal wound healing. Chronic and subclinical inflammation can play as a hidden factor causing haze. Here is a patient who had good vision immediately after refractive surgery but presented few months later with blurring of vision which improved with glasses but refractive acceptance was variable. What could be the cause for this? We tried to roll out the usual suspects. Corneal topography was not suggestive of ectasia and dilated refraction revealed improvement in uncorrected visuality without any refractive acceptance. This is suggestive of accommodation spasm which was also seen in aberrometry with increase in aberrations from internal optics. On looking into literature, we found that accommodation spasm is known to occur in conditions of acute stress and excessive near work. Treatment of this patient was done by strong cycloplegia for few weeks, which was slowly tapered. Refractive surgery is quite a safe procedure until something goes wrong. Like the time I lost my flap during a microkeratome LASIK. I placed a bandage contact lens and let the cornea heal. But patient was disappointed with her vision post-surgery and demanded for solution. Her corneal topography was irregular, OCT revealed epithelial irregularity and there was increase in aberrations arising from the cornea. We decided to treat this patient using topo-guided neutralization technique. Treatment was first planned by changing the Q value to 0 and then ablation profile was decided according to TNT protocol. Post-operatively, there was increase in unaided visual acuity, regularization of corneal topography, topo guided treatment can help in the management. Good preoperative evaluation is indispensable to in prevention of dry eyes. Inflammation in neuropathic pain is influenced by vitamin D in B12. High OSDI is clue regarding presence of dendrites around the nerves. Preoperative inflammation may be a factor in the development of case. It is important to seek a 
incomplete information and factors into the data. Accommodation spasm is more common than we recognize. Abnormality evaluation, if available, will show high internal abrasions, strong cycloplegia, and gradual tapering off is needed. Flap loss is uncommon. Topoidal treatment may be our savior. The world as we know is changing. Cities are growing. Technology is advancing at a rapid pace. Yet the way we diagnose dry eye has not changed much. Despite our best surgical and management outcomes, many patients are still not happy because symptoms of dryness cast a shadow over the good vision that was obtained. One may think giving lubricants is enough, but patient will only change doctors and lubricants without any relief. As you decide to set up a dry eye clinic, the first big question is how does one get started? Which tests will help me the most and how do I scale up my practice? We present a step-by-step -step approach towards setting up a tertiary dry eye center. One can start with having a well-defined space in the OPD just for dry eye diagnostics. As they say, first impression makes the best impression. Patient today makes a choice only after a good research. Absence on the web could be a huge setback. If the patient has better understanding of his symptoms, it will only result in better compliance to therapy. Spending time and understanding the patient's problems can solve some atypical mysteries. Many causes of dry eye have systemic manifestations. And if an immunologist, rheumatologist and dry eye specialist work as a team, one can provide a holistic solution. The first test in the first step of investigation and management is providing a self-assessment questionnaire to test the impact of dryness in the patients. Ocular surface disease index score and impact of dry eye on everyday life questionnaire are more popular amongst the rest and have been proven to be reliable. Then comes the Shermer's test. The strip is hooked to the lower mid margin towards the lateral one third. Patient is asked to blink normally or close their eyes. Wetting after 5 minutes is indicative of basal and reflex secretion of tears. In the clinical setting, tear film breakup time can be carried out with the help of a moistened fluorescein strip or by installation by a pipette and viewing using a yellow barrier filter on slit lamp. Care should be taken to avoid touching the conjunctiva with the strip. Fluorescein, rose bengal and lizamine green can all be used to stain the cornea and conjunctiva to see the impact on ocular surface. Lizamine green scores over rose bengal due to reduced patient discomfort. Oxford scoring is a useful tool to categorize the severity of ocular surface involvement. Though we don't come to know about the exact etiology of the condition based on staining pattern, we can get a fair amount of idea about the etiology. It helps us in planning our therapy better. Investigations from this level can only guide us to treat the patient symptomatically. Tests of next level would be needed to know the cause of the disease. Desiccating stress and hyperosmolarity are known to increase the level of endopeptidase matrix metalloproteinases in corneal epithelial cells and tears. Interactions between cytokines and MMPs creates a cycle of escalating inflammation. It can be checked very easily using inflammar dry disposable single-use assay. Osmolarity is the measure of solid particles in a solution. It is considered one of the most reliable markers of dry eye disease severity. Tear osmolarity more than 316 milliosmoles per liter is definitive of dry eye disease irrespective of the cause. We have traditionally assessed mebomian glands looking at the lit signs on slit lamp. Mabography is the only direct imaging technique of viewing the glands and it can be done using confocal microscopy, OCT based mibography and infrared mibography systems. Bosch infrared device is an easy to use handheld mibographer. 
It captures images using 5 megapixel camera and can be transferred to a computer with ease. The algorithm demarcates the glands, computes various metrics based on gland morphology. One microliter of tears are collected using a capillary tube from the lower meniscus. It is dropped onto the slide and allowed to dry. Ferning pattern is considered normal. No ferning or partial ferning is considered abnormal. The cause of dry eye, extent of damage to the ocular structures and modifications needed in the therapy are known to us now. Optical Quality Analysis System OCAS, uses a double pass technique to calculate the scattering of light from the ocular surface. Eyes with poor tear film cause higher scatter in addition to those that have undergone surgery and have cataract. Impact of drops can be studied using tear film analysis program. It records dynamic changes of objective scatter index over 20 seconds with measurements taken every half a second. Lippy View uses interferometry to measure the lipid layer's thickness between the blinks and gives a quantitative assessment of interferometric color units as an indicator of Mabomin gland dysfunction. Those with lipid layer thickness of less than 60 microns have been seen to have definitive symptoms of dryness. Imaging of corneal layers with special focus on corneal nerves is the advantage of confocal microscopy. Presence of dendrite subbasal nerve plexus changes in severe forms of evaporative dry eye and with ocular pain have been noted in some studies. We now know the impact of dryness on quality of vision. Though medical management of dry eye has to start right at the first level with modifications based on interpretations at every level of practice, therapy like thermal pulsation for meibomian gland dysfunction and establishing a dry eye spa can be quite an expense which not many can afford. Establishing a tertiary care referral center offering eye spa packages for various dry eye diseases has led to better outcomes and better profitability in practice. Finding answers to questions and diving into the depths of molecular biology and connecting cytoplasm to slit lamp can only show light towards the future of dry eye management. Those wanting to lead by example should venture into setting up a dry eye molecular lab and be a pioneer in research. To summarize our stepwise approach, Start with minimal investment investigations, questionnaires and staining of ocular surface. Step up to include devices and tests that help in determining the etiology accurately. With the next level, add devices which help to determine anatomical, structural and functional changes in dry eye. Eye spa and thermal pulsation therapy should be aimed for those who want to set up a tertiary referral center for dry eye. Research is a give back time to science when one wants to find answers to those unanswered questions. It's time we take dry eye more seriously. It's time we step up and set up. Thank you, Dr. Krishna Pujita. Now, can we call Dr. Aishwarya onto the stage? COMZ, an innovation to teach complex surgeries. And uh, the next speaker to be ready is. Uh, Dr. Ingawale Ameya Rajas Deepak. The authors have no financial interest in the subject matter of the film. It was this surgery with subluxated back stabilization, cataract removal, and subsequent IOL placement where the story began. fellows who are trained in phaco emulsification but asked to describe their feeling in one word after seeing this surgery. Difficult, complicated, exhausted, confusing. With this response, the question was how to initiate their training. Animations do not give hand and eye coordination and simulators are not equipped enough to handle such fine surgeries. That's when COMSI was invented. It is your personal model that makes learning complicated surgeries easy. This hemispherical bowl is the key to COMSI. 
Combs mainly features a main port, side port, steel flaps, central pupillary area, and various other enhancements. It aids in teaching and learning complex surgeries. Firstly, COMZ aids in understanding ex vivo SFIL technique for which two side flaps and a central wound have been made. Two long needles are inserted one after the another in the bore of the functional cannula and the thread is withdrawn from the main wound. The thread is then cut and a 3D IOL is attached by the knots and then pull from the scleral flaps on the side. The thread is cut and then tied, completing the procedure. Similarly, in vivo technique can also be demonstrated using COMZ where the functional cannula takes a straight needle from the main wound via the scleral pocket from both the sides and then the IOL is stabilized beneath the iris in the ciliary sulcus. Comsi can also be used to demonstrate zonular dialysis. In this case, the capsular bag in Comsi with the corneal enhancement has laxity due to zonular dialysis. This 3D capsular ring can be put from the main port to stabilize the bag again. In certain situations, where the capsular tension ring is inserted in the bag prior to the surgery, the demonstration can be explained on COMZ with corneal enhancement as to how insertion can take place and how it's to be rotated to stabilize the bag. The use of capsular tension segment can be seen in the following example where there is a larger area of zonular dialysis. First, the threading of the capsular tension segment takes place and then it is slowly inserted in the area of zonular weakness with the help of replica needles from the main wound which are guided out from the side scleral wounds. The knots are then tied outside within the scleral wound to stabilize the capsular bag. We can also demonstrate the use of iris hooks on COMZ in cases of small pupil where the four functional iris hooks are inserted one by one. Then using the rubber stoppers, they mimic the dilatation of the pupil. In another example, a subluxated bag with zonular laxity can be replicated on a COMSI device to show the use of capsular hooks in order to stabilize it before phacoemulsification takes place. Comsi uses all these ophthalmic replicas which are handmade and prepared using indigenous substances easily found at home. Comsi is all about innovation with simplicity for teaching the basics of most complex cataract surgeries. It's easy to clean, it can be used by multiple number of students and can be customized for both right and left handers. We hope Comsi is adopted by learning surgeons all over the world who nurture the dream of becoming better in such delicate surgical situations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our 
our next presenter is uh, Dr. I A R Deepak. I have sorted your name. Hello, my name is Ameya. Uh -huh. No financial interest. Corneal blindness is the leading cause of blindness in India, second only to cataracts. There is a cross shortage of donor tissues to meet the need. In 2011, Heindel et al. published a series of 100 consecutive patients. They could use a single donor cornea for two recipients in 47 of the 50 cases. They also showed that the split anterior and posterior donor tissue could be stored safely for up to a week. The same year in India, a series of 12 was published where the donor eyes were split using a micro keratome and successfully used for 12 automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasties and 12 desme stripping automated endothelial keratoplasties. Frugality is the need of the hour. We describe a technique to use a single tissue for two lamellar surgeries. A 10 or 10.5 mm trephine is gently used on the endothelium. Trepan staining is done to identify damaged endothelium and to outline the trephined area. The desmase membrane is scored with the Sinsky's hook. The edge of the scored DM is gently lifted and peeled using a single pull technique. An L mark is made over the folded DM, taking care not to damage the endothelium. A second poor quality research tissue is peeled off its DM and is used as a base for the donor DM. A soft contact lens may be used as an alternative. A 3 mm punch is made in this tissue. The donor DM is gently lifted and laid on the research tissue, ensuring endothelium side is up. We confirm this using the L mark as a guide. We should be able to see a mirror image of the L. The donor tissue is properly aligned. The anterior lamella of the donor is punched and it is used in DALC. The big bubble of DALC is the first bubble of our double bubble keratoplasty. DALC is completed as usual. After completion of DALC, we begin with our next surgery, a desmase membrane endothelial keratoplasty. A 7.5 mm mark is made with a trephine and corneal marker to assist in the positioning of the DM endothelial graft. Main and side port incisions are made. Recipient DM is scored using a reverse Sinsky. The DM is stripped and removed. The research tissue with the donor DM is punched with a 7.5 mm trephine and the trimmed donor DM is placed in a balanced salt solution bath. It is aspirated using our DMEC injector. It is then injected into the anterior chamber of the patient. A suture is placed to maintain the anterior chamber. The donor DM is gently aligned with our markings. In goes the second bubble of our double bubble technique. The graft is well opposed in the immediate post-operative period and we see a crystal clear cornea within a week. The DALC patient is doing well with the best corrected visual acuity of 6 by 9. We have replicated this story for 10 donor eyes and are now routinely performing consecutive anterior and posterior lamellar keratoplasties. We hope this technique of optimization of tissues is emulated in all centers. 
there are about 20 lakh patients with corneal blindness in India today, to which 40 to 50 thousand are added annually. Most of these patients are young and active. Corneal blindness prevents them from being economically independent and also adds a burden to the society and their families. To fulfill the demand supply gap in the availability of corneal tissues, we need at least 2 lakh eye donations per year which will yield approximately 1 lakh transplantable tissues considering wastage. At present, the figure stands close to 20 to 30 thousand tissues only out of which only 10 to 15 thousand are usable. We as corneal surgeons needed to devise a method to counteract this huge deficit. Double bubble keratoplasty, one donor, four recipients is our contribution to this cause. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Amea. Uh, may I request Dr. Samar, Samar Basak to give his presentation, which was missed earlier. The next will be Dr. Rashmi Krishnamurti to be ready. Thank you, uh, the panelist. You joined Shankar Nethali, yeah? Huh? <laughs> when did you join Shankar Nethali? <laughs> I don't know. DMEC is the new frontier in endothelial keratoplasty. Most surgeons give 3 to 3.5 mm clear corneal incision for transfer of donor DM roll. This incision needs to be closed immediately by a suture before attempting any manipulation of donor desmets for unscrolling. Uniplanar corneal incision induces more astigmatism. Furthermore, there is always a chance of extrusion of DM roll out of the eye even after suture placement. Here, we describe a simplified technique of stitchless DMIC procedure. First, let's start with DMIC triple in Fuchs endothelial dystrophy with cataract. 8.5 mm template marking two side ports on either side, triton blue injection, small phonix based conjunctival flap in superior limbus, wet field cautery, 3 mm clerocorneal tunnel which is triplanar, the inner edge of the tunnel is just outside the template mark. After capsular excess, phacoemulsification was done with single piece intraocular lens implantation in the back. 8.5 mm desmet stripping along the template mark under red fundal glow. Thorough AC wash to clean all viscoelastics. Intracameral pilocarpine to constrict the pupil. Inferior peripheral iridectomy is done with a vitrector. BSS wash is given to clear oozing blood. Air injection to give temporary tamponade to stop bleeding from PI site. Now, Donor DM roll preparation by the surgeon. 9.5 mm partial trephination with simple trephine, triton blue staining. Peripheral DM is removed with Macpherson's forceps. Make sure to remove totally along the trephination mark. Lift the edge of the DM in one place. Second time, triton blue staining for better visibility. With Macpherson's forceps, by single hand technique, DM peeling is done in one go up to 90% area. 3 mm trephination of the stroma. Float back the DM in its proper position. Reverse the tissue. DM side is marked with S stamp. Cornea is flipped back with endothelial side up 
and 8 mm partial trephination. Extra DM is removed and main donor DM is separated and stained with Triton Blue for 30 to 45 seconds. It is then washed thoroughly. Donor roll is ready for injector system. Now back to the recipient eye. Air is replaced by DSS and wounds are cleaned. DM roll is transferred into recipient eye by injection. Be sure that tip of the cartridge is within the anterior chamber. Even small air bubble can be removed via the main port. No suture is required at this point. It is a much more secured sclerocorneal valve. Gentle tapping, intermittent VSS injection and decompression via side ports help unrolling of DM. Totally a no-touch technique by two cannulas to unscrew the DM completely in the right orientation as evident by right S mark. Centration of graft with slow air injection. Just complete air fill. No stitch and conjunctiva is closed with wet field cautery. Second case is DMEC alone in PBK. 8.5 mm template marking after epithelium debridement, similar side ports and tripen blue injection, similar triplanar 3.0 mm scleroconeal tunnel as in the previous case, 8.5 mm desmet stripping along the template mark, triton blue helps in visualization, Inferior peripheral iridectomy with a vitrector, air injection, DM roll is transferred into the anterior chamber by injection. Again, no stitch is given. Gentle tapping by two cannulas and play with BSS via side ports. Complete unscrolling of DM roll, centering and gentle air injection. Just complete air fill. Conjunctiva is closed by cautery. A bandage contact lens at the end. Next case is stitchless DMEC in failed DSEC. A biplanar 3.5 mm scleroconeal tunnel is prepared after making conjunctival flap. Side port incisions and release of areas of peripheral anterior synechae. Careful removal of edematous DSEC lenticules. Inferior PI with vitrector. Donor transfer via injector system. No touch technique of DM manipulation by two cannulas to unscroll it completely. Donor centration and air injection. Conjunctiva is closed by cautery. Air pressure is checked. Most important step in stitchless DB procedure is to give biplanar or triplanar sclerocorneal valve incision. It should be 1 mm posterior to the limbus and internal incision just outside 8.5 mm template mark. During donor insertion, the tip of the injector cartridge should be within the anterior chamber. Even in presence of deep anterior chamber, the donor manipulation is quite safe as the multi-planar scleroconeal valve is more watertight. No need of suturing and its removal. Insertion induced astigmatism is released. Easy conjunctival closure. In conclusion, the simple DMEC procedure 
is reproducible for most of the cases. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Pasak. Uh, may I call upon Dr. Rashmi Krishnamurthy for a video on management of tube erosion complication. Uh, do we have Dr. Avanind Gupta here? Okay, you are next, sir. Glaucoma drainage devices are posterior subconjunctival implants with a long tube connecting the anterior chamber and the equatorial plate. They play a significant role in the treatment of refractory glaucomas in both children and adults. Implants are safe and effective. However, they can also be associated with serious site threatening complications. In this video, we shall present early and late post-operative complications related to Ahmed glaucoma valve implantation. We shall also share practical tips and techniques to prevent these complications. Based on the location, the implant related complications can be classified as tube or plate related. Intraocular tube related complications can be due to tube block or tube corneal touch or due to excessive tube movement. Tube can be blocked with fibrin or blood clot and often clears with increasing the dosage and duration of topical steroids. If the tube is blocked with vitreous, silicon oil, or iris tissue, it would require an intervention either with a laser or surgery. Tube corneal touch can happen due to anterior tube placement or due to anterior tube migration. This complication can be prevented by proper surgical technique and placing an adequate length of the tube in the mid anterior chamber parallel to the limbus. In eyes with shallow anterior chamber or post keratoplasty eyes, Sulcus placement of the tube or parse planar tube placement is a better option. If there is a tube corneal contact, redirecting the tube with or without tube trimming is helpful. Dynamic or excessive tube movement in the anterior chamber is a relatively rare complication. This occurs due to improper tube fixation. This would require a surgical correction if there is a corneal decompensation. This complication can be prevented by proper tube and plate fixation. Tube retraction is a complication rarely seen in children. The tube is shortened relatively due to the enlargement of the child's eyeball with age. This can be corrected with a tube extender. This could also be prevented by leaving a little longer tube in children, taking care to place it parallel to the limbus. Subconjunctival tube erosion is a most common late post-operative complication following glaucoma drainage devices. This can occur closer to the limbus or posteriorly. Tube erosions may be associated with aqueous leak as well. Tube erosions closer to the limbus are more common and occur due to conjunctival retraction or retraction of the patch graft. This can also occur due to conjunctival erosions related to repeated lid movements. This complication can be prevented by covering the entire subconjunctival tube length with a donor patch graft followed by a watertight and traction free conjunctival closure. Tube erosion needs surgical treatment to prevent serious complications like endophthalmitis. Management of tube erosion includes identifying the area of the erosion, 
covering the exposed tube with a patch graft and appropriate conjunctival closure. The conjunctival closure can be achieved by conjunctival advancement or using a free conjunctival autograft. The technique of repair is based on the extent of the erosion, location of the erosion, mobility and health of the surrounding conjunctiva and the availability of patch graft. Here we describe two clinical situations of tube erosion and their management. In this case, there is a small area of tube erosion closer to the limbus. A good conjunctival dissection is performed. The epithelium surrounding and adjacent to the erosion is debrided with the help of gentle cautery and a 15 number blade. This step is important to prevent epithelial inclusion cysts in the postoperative period. And this epithelial debridement also will help improve the adhesion of the patch graft. An adequate size donor patch graft was fashioned and was used to cover the tube and was fixed with fibrin glue. Since adequate and healthy conjunctiva was available, conjunctival advancement was performed and watertight conjunctival closure was achieved with 8-0 vicryl suture. In the second case, the tube erosion was slightly posterior and this was associated with severe conjunctival scarring as well. A different technique was used for repair of this tube erosion. The steps of conjunctival dissection, epithelial debridement and the scleral patch closure were similar to the previous case. Since the conjunctiva was severely scarred in this patient, conjunctival autograft was harvested from inferior conjunctiva which was used to cover the patch graft. The harvested autograft should at least be 2 mm larger than the conjunctival defect to account for post-operative conjunctival scarring during the wound healing process. The conjunctiva was initially glued to help spread the graft tissue and was secured using 10 nylon interrupted sutures and always the limbal orientation is maintained. Another technique that is helpful is redirecting the tube through the pars plana and the tube is covered with patch graft and conjunctival autograft or conjunctival advancement. Plate exposure is a rare but serious complication most often needing explantation of the device. Explantation of the device can also be combined with a re-implantation of a new device in another location at the same sitting or at a later date. To summarize, glaucoma drainage devices have improved our care of complex glaucomas. Although rare, implant related complications can be serious and site threatening. Proper planning and meticulous surgery can prevent most complications. However, if these complications occur, early recognition and appropriate intervention would go a long way in successful management of eyes with complex glaucomas. Thank you very much, <coughs> Dr. Rasmi. Uh, may I now call upon Dr. Avininda Gupta uh, for his film on indispensable Chandler. aid in complex anterior segment surgery, Chandler's retroillumination. Chandler retroillumination, an indispensable aid in complex anterior segment surgery, a simple yet extremely useful technique to get you out of sticky situations. Anterior segment surgery, especially phacoid emulsification in a hazy cornea is a challenge for even best of surgeons. To handle this complex situation, we propose the use of chandelier retroillumination. So what is this chandelier retroillumination? Let us get you out from darkness to light. Dude, perfect. What's up guys, we're Dude Perfect. Welcome to Glow in the Dark Edition. You guys ready to get glowing? All right, let's do it. Here we go. In coalesive illumination, the light shining on the retinal surface gets reflected back to give a red glow. This red glow is extremely useful for a surgeon as it enhances depth perception and view of posterior capsule, especially during chopping of nucleus and cortex aspiration. 
in patients with corneal opacity, light from a microscope is unable to enter the eye or is scattered, resulting in poor red glow and a nightmare for the surgeon. A 25 gauge chandelier and illuminator with its self retaining nature is able to circumvent this problem. It is easy to insert transcontinentally, provides great visualization of lens and capsule through gazing media, and leaves a self sealing wound. It is placed at pass plana made vertical and then a microscope lights are switched off. In the darkness, in the darkness, in the darkness, I will find you. A 65-year-old male patient undergoing cataract surgery with view hindered because of corneal opacities. The staining of the capsule is done under microscope light, then the surgery is performed further under retroillumination. A good red glow ensures a uniform capsular excess. Nucleotomy and cortical aspiration are easily performed. inserted in the back. That didn't seem difficult enough, the technique worked well in a one-eyed patient with history of blast injury, an extremely hazy cornea with a hard subluxated cataract. Retroillumination also helps in a decent graft positioning in a hazy cornea. In the darkness, in the darkness, in the darkness. This technique also helped to successfully tackle a heart cataract by a 76 year old female with a small eye and a hazy cornea due to spheroidal degeneration.
most stuff, ideas such as this from innovative minds make the path smoother. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Now, uh, Dr. Ekta Rishi, yeah, she'll be presenting on pupil reconstruction in traumatic anaerobia using a bursting suture. And the next two speakers uh, will be Dr. Saumya and Dr. Lisa.
sclerent tunnel dissection was done. 23 gauge sclerotomy ports were made. Corneal side port entries were made. The retroflexed iris was then easily pulled with the end ripping forceps. A 10 0 polypropylene needle was passed through the corneal entry to take the iris sutures as per the plan. The 27 gauge needle helped to guide the needle out of the eye and to reinsert to change the direction. To continue the running of the stitch, the scleral indentation helped in better visualization. The running stitch was continued to cover 360 degree of the iris. And the suture was finally brought out to the entry port. A temporary knot was then tied to form the pupil. The residual superior defect was repaired with a similar stitch. And the knot was finalized. At this stage, a foldable IOL was inserted and the haptics were externalized and tucked into the square. The pupil size was adjusted and the knot was finalized. The section was sutured and secured. The scleral flaps and conjunctiva were opposed with glue The IOL was centered and stable and this is how it looked even after 3 years. Pearl string suture for pupil reconstruction is a novel technique with no reference in published literature. The ideal candidates are plant injury patients with sphincter tears. It is safe with no notice inflammatory reaction. This is the pre-operative picture and the post-operative picture of the same patient. Now he had no glare and had a relatively good vision. Thank you Dr. Ekta, uh, Dr. Soumya R for our next uh, video on Modified Nishida's procedure for monocular elevation deficit. And we have last speaker, Dr. Lisa. She's around? Okay. Modified Nishida's procedure for monocular elevation deficiency. Seven year old child presented with drooping of the left eyelid since birth. On examination, his best corrected visual acuity was 66 N6 in the right eye, 618 N8 in the left eye. Left eye shows ptosis, cavity shows primary gaze left hypotropia with a gross limitation of elevation in the left eye. Diagnosis of left eye MED was made. The various surgical options for MED. NAPS procedure is a very well established procedure involving full tendon transposition of medial rectus and lateral rectus superiorly. Correction obtained by NAPS procedure can be further enhanced using a posterior fixation suture or foster suture which is called as an augmented NAPS procedure. 
when hypotropia is associated with significant horizontal deviation, a modified NAPS procedure can be performed in which the superior half of horizontal recti is transposed superiorly which carries the hypotropia and the inferior halves are recessed and resected according to the horizontal deviation to correct it. All of this transposition procedure can be done with or without inferior rectus recession depending on the force duction test results. Modified Nishida's procedure is a well established procedure for complete lateral rectus palsy. I thought of trying the same procedure in our case of MED. Intraoperatively, FTT was done, which showed a tight inferior rectus muscle. So, inferior rectus muscle was resisted by 3.5 mm via routine limbal conjunctival incision. This was followed by modified Nishida's procedure which essentially involves transposing the medial rectus muscle and lateral rectus muscle supranasally and supratemporally using a non-absorbable suture. Routine inferior rectus recession of 3.5 mm was done. After this, a radial conjunctival incision was taken in the supratemporal quadrant. The incision extended till 9 o'clock position. Lateral rectus muscle was hooked and isolated. Mark was made on superior border of lateral rectus muscle 10 mm behind the insertion. 5-0 ethibond suture was passed through superior one third of lateral rectus muscle in 2-1-1 fashion. The same suture was passed through superotemporal sclera 12 mm behind the limbus. The suture was tied thus transposing the lateral rectus muscle superiorly. This suture shifts the lateral rectus vector forces superiorly without tenotomy or splitting of the muscle as in routine transposition procedure. The same procedure was repeated on the medial rectus muscle. Superonasal radial conjunctival incision was taken. Medial rectus muscle was hooked and isolated. 5-0 ethibond suture was placed through superior one third of medial rectus muscle 10 mm behind the insertion. Same suture was passed through the sclera 12 mm behind the limbus in the supranasal quadrant, thus transposing medial rectus forces superior. Conjunctiva was closed with 80 vicral sutures. Pictorial representation of the modified Nishida's procedure for MED. This shows the horizontal recti muscle transposed superior. The procedure consists of suturing the superior muscle belly margins of the horizontal recti to superotemporal and supranasal sclera. These sutures make the horizontal muscle bellies superiorly transferred and create additional muscle insertion as new points of action. Therefore, the transposed muscle bellies can create elevational force at the suturing point. Greatest advantage being simple to perform and less traumatic to the eye as it does not involve tenotomy or splitting of the muscle. First week post-operative photos showing orthotropia in the primary position and improved elevation to minus 3. First month post-op showing orthophoria in the primary position with an improved elevation. Comparing the pre- and post-operative photos shows the correction achieved by the procedure. Correction achieved by this procedure is equivalent to that 
obtained by NAPS procedure. Thus, modified Nishida's procedure is a viable option in cases of monocular elevation deficiency. This is the first case report of modified Nishida's procedure for monocular elevation deficiency. Being relatively simple to perform, less traumatic to the eye and the reversibility of it scores over the established procedures. So, modified Nishida's procedure is very useful in cases of monocular elevation deficiency. Thank you Dr. Soumya. Uh, we have the last speaker, Dr. Lisa Arbiser. Uh, this will be a non-competitive uh, video film. You have eight minutes to present, Dr. Lisa. Yes. Eight minutes. I'm sorry? Eight minutes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to be here and to present for Dr. Lisa Arbiser. I just wanted to tell you that there are many patients who require examination that is under anesthesia or deeper anesthesia, even general anesthesia, because of physical or age or uh, intellectual limitations. And in these cases, there is a difficulty in trying to minimize future um, complications and future exposure to the risks of anesthesia and even a YAG capsulotomy. So in this case, we planned a sequential, immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery with placement of the optic through both capsulotomies, the anterior and posterior to burger space. A 65-year-old intellectually limited gentleman who had stopped participating in activities and couldn't find his food any longer. On examination, he had bilateral black cataracts with deep chambers and clear corneas. The IOP was normal to finger tension. There are glimpses of the fundus that showed a view consistent with his function. The plan was for examination under anesthesia with measurements, bilateral immediate sequential phacal emulsification with primary posterior capsulotomy and posterior optic capture, and the plan was to perform surgery on the worst eye first, which is in your upper left. The technique demonstrated here is one of circumferential disassembly of a very dense nuclear sclerotic cataract. There are some critical first steps with this technique. It is important to have appropriately sized and tight incisions for the second instrument and the phaco needle. This helps maintain the anterior chamber during the procedure. This scholastic is also liberally reinstalled during the procedure in order to protect the endothelium and the intraocular structures. You can see here that a vertical chopping technique is being used with that the Rosen splitter, which has a blunt tip and a sharp inner aspect of the end, uh, is used to sever the interdigitating posterior fibers of the small pie-shaped pieces that are being engaged and separated with the Rosen splitter. The technique involves small bursts of phaco energy, which are used to engage the dense nucleus, pull it slightly centrally, while cross-action chopping vertically with the second instrument. And this allows for very minimal stress on the zonules. It's a meticulously controlled and gentle way of removing a very dense cataract like the black cataracts seen in this patient. As more of the endonucleus is removed, only the posterior shell remains. At this stage, less aggressive phaco settings are set on the machine and the posterior plate can be carefully flipped over centrally and removed with the second instrument now being used to protect the posterior capsule by placing it posterior to the phaco tip. The second eye, which is the image on the lower right on the screen has now had the dense cataract completely removed. The first eye is on the upper left and has just bits of the posterior plate remaining. Once all of the fragments are removed from the anterior chamber, it is filled with a dispersive viscoelastic and the anterior and posterior leaflets of the capsule are collapsed. A 30 gauge needle with the bevel up is then used to engage the posterior capsule 
and create a small perforation. And you can see that happening at this stage in the upper left. It is important to engage the posterior capsule centrally where there is a potential space between the anterior hyaloidal face and the posterior capsule. We take advantage of this space once the posterior capsule is opened by enlarging it with a cohesive viscoelastic. The posterior capsule is then torn in a continuous curvilinear capsulorexis, slightly smaller in size than the optic and the anterior capsulotomy. It is important to realize that the very thin four to five micron posterior capsule is very elastic, very similar to pediatric anterior capsule, and therefore it should be torn more centrally in order to control the size. In the upper left, uh, the posterior capsule or opening was not quite large enough in one dimension and intraocular scissors can be used to initiate the tear again and enlarge it. The three-piece hydrophobic acrylic lens is then being inserted into the sulcus. Both haptics will be placed in the sulcus and the optic will then be captured through both the anterior and posterior capsulotomies by pushing 90 degrees to the optic-haptic junction and carefully walking the optic edge behind both the anterior and posterior capsule edges. And you can see in this case, the patient will have a clear visual axis without any possibility of PCO for life. Bilateral immediately sequential surgery in this case and others avoids unnecessary exposure to the risks of anesthesia by performing both eye surgery at the same event. Capture of the optic in Berger space allows avoidance of comorbidities associated with a YAG capsulotomy, including floaters and violation of the separation provided by the anterohyaloidal face. These are not benign procedures, and in this case, we have a patient who will see well in both eyes with no further additional risks associated with his cataract surgery or the potential need for a YAG capsulotomy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. This is a non-competitive video. Somebody wants to ask a question, we'll allow it this time. Uh, Dr. Lisa. There's a question for you. <laughs> she so, saw the Brunus and cataract. Th this gentleman was 65, but but it would be appropriate for pediatric patients as well in the event that you don't want to have to bring them back to the OR and have the the risk of additional anesthesia. Well, in this case, you have an excellently optically clear pathway with a absolutely uh, zero risk of needing a YAG capsulotomy in the future in this patient who could not cooperate with a YAG. But we also have uh, probably liquefied vitreous by this time. I'm sorry? The, uh, since he's 65, his uh, vitreous, uh, the gel vitreous probably might be fluid by now. So we have breached the anterior posterior barrier. Yes. So, so it may be that Anteriorly, it already is liquefied, but again, you would have to take this patient back for YAG capsulotomy in the future if you left the capsule intact. And in many of our patients now, we're seeing late dislocations from zonular laxity, especially a patient like this who's intellectually limited and maybe rubbing his eyes. And in this case, having the haptics in the sulcus will lead to long-term stabilization and centration without zonular rupture being a, a factor in late dislocation. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that was a quite exhaustive session with so many videos, uh, 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 very instructive videos. Thank you very much for all the uh, presenters and all the audience who have patiently sat through the program and all my co-judges for having judged the session. Thank you very much.